Good evening, everybody, for our final seminar of the night. We have Mr. Tim Scott from Epic Campus YouTube channel and TikTok channel. He's here to drop some knowledge on you about how to catch big fish. Give it up for Tim Scott, everybody. All right, take it away, Tim. All right, so I'm going to start with a question. How, what do you guys want to hear about? Want to hear about channel cats? Want to hear about flatheads? Want to hear about blues? Want to hear about the Mississippi, the Missouri lakes? What do we want to hear about? All right, I guess we'll just talk about a bunch. So, of course, I talk a lot about catfishing. I talk a lot about catfish science, and I haven't talked too much about catfish science because usually it's kind of it's a lot easier to talk about it when you're kind of talking to one or two people or there's questions constantly coming and people are thinking about stuff. So kind of decided what I could do is kind of talk about some Zen things first, some things that people don't normally think of when it comes to catfish, how they behave, their their entire cycle. And then what I want to do is I, I want to talk about how to pick a good possibility on finding a spot that, um, that, that, that actually holds big fish. Because that's something that you don't really hear much about. So I suppose I could start with kind of going through my brain's process on how to pick a spot just to actually choose not necessarily a spot, but say a pool, an entire pool on a river. What does it have? One of the main things I look for is a major tributary, believe that or not. I want one major tributary coming into a pool on the, on the, on the Mississippi. So you might have a stretch. That thing does not want to stay up. I'll leave it down. So this whole stretch might be 100 miles long, and you've got a dam here, a dam here, and a dam here. This one here might be a big, wide pool. Not that there's not giant fish there, because there certainly is. But these big, wide pools, the habitat is so diverse and so... It's, it's not that it's daunting. A guy can find fish. But it's going to be a lot easier for me in one day and to maintain being efficient and upping my success rate if I can pick a pool that's maybe like this one, that's narrow and maybe has some offshoots, maybe has some islands, maybe has some, and it doesn't often make for the most beautiful settings in the world, but I like industrial stuff. I like barges, I like pylons, I like pillars, I like, I like, I like heavy barge traffic, believe that or not. Heavy barge traffic keeps things. Anybody heard of the barge bite? I'm here to tell you it's real. It's a real thing. And I doubted it for a long time because I was like, well, I don't know about this barge bite thing. But it's proven itself time and time again that if, if, if the bite's not all that great, you can sit for 20 minutes. One barge comes through and it disrupts the water. It starts churning things up and it get, for some reason it gets a little excited. Maybe some bait fish get disoriented they feel like they can you know run around and be successful so it will perk up a bite and and sometimes and that's what i was getting ready to talk about with the rod sometimes you're in a zone you've got your baits placed and you're just not close enough to the fish so i think the barge bite is one of those things that it could shift and we see this when we fish below dams they shut one gate off they turn another one on or they shut one down and they open up a couple. Sometimes it'll shift fish towards you. And it happens just like that. And you're like, huh, huh, now I see what I got to do. So one thing about that is these riverine pools. Kind of compresses their habitat, which lets me be more successful in a short amount of time. Because so after all, one thing that I don't have these days is a ton of time. I don't have seven days that I can go stay on a river and live like Robinson Crusoe and just catfish all day. So I've got to have my bait ready. And usually I get my bait ready. And this is all about the efficiency of it. So me being a big monster hunter, I've got to think of these terms. I've got to, I can't fail because there's, 
if I'm supposed to leave Friday and I haven't got bait, then I got to depend on trying to, to, to net me or try to catch it. So usually, and that takes some investment, you know, I've got a big bait tank, it's chilled and all this stuff. So I catch my big donkey suckers, bring them home. They're all ready. Sean shows up at the house. We hook up and we take off. But the whole time we're driving for three hours and you can ask him, I am putting a plan together in my head of what I think is going to go on because I've been paying attention to the water levels. I've been paying attention to the weather because there's certain tendencies they're going to do. Like if the weather has been stable for three, four days in a row, water levels been stable, temperature has been pretty stable. I know for about 90% that we're going to have a good couple of days fishing. And it might be the best day of the year because as long as that it's stable, but as soon as that water starts to drop, that can affect the bite. As soon as the temperature starts to drop, it can affect the bite because what it does in terms of catfish behavior is they can be over here when the water's up, but as soon as that water starts dropping, they have to go down to deeper water. And every catfish is like that. So maybe blues are sitting in 15 foot of water, which they don't normally do, but say they are. As soon as that water comes down, they gotta they they have to stay alive. So as soon as that water goes down, the pressure at their tank releases off of their swim bladder, and then all of a sudden phew, they're moving. Cold fronts invariably shut the bite down. So I, I want to see that good stable thing. So now I mean we're all happy. We're we're happy because the, the temperature was good. We got good, nice warm weather. Maybe it's a little warming trend. Maybe we got a slow rise. I I I do not like if it's rained really hard up and, you know, it's going to come up two or three feet. Never done that great on giant fish that way because big fish have the luxury of eating whenever they want to or not eating whenever they want to. And everybody thinks, you know, a big giant, you know, blue cat like this creature over here is, is a big ravenous creature. It is at times, but most of the time it's not. Most of the time it's just positioning, just living, just hovering. Maybe laying on the bottom, whatever. But I've got to be there at the right place at the right time. So what I'll do, Sean and I will get in. We'll take the boat out, and we're going to scan the area. We might take the first two, three hours just to look at 20 different spots. I'm going to try to mark big fish. If we can mark big fish, I'll kind of rate it. I'll say, yeah, it looks like a five compared to what we've seen. You know, I saw a couple good fish. They look like three-footers. They look like summer. 40 inch fish and I'm going to mark that down. I said, this spot is number five spot. We've checked four before it and eh, it's all right, but this is, this is the last one. So then I'll say, okay, if I see a couple other good fish in the right kind of zone, and they look like they're actively positioned. I might stop and fish them right then, but if they're close to the bottom or they're just hovering like high off the bottom like this, I'll choose not to fish them right at the point because what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a, a setup point to ambush fish. I, I, I want a wider swath where I've marked big fish, and I want a culmination point where I can use one anchor to have an epic trip. Maybe a couple of 60s, maybe a 70, an 80, and a 90. Maybe we catch a 100-pound fish. You know, whatever, whatever that takes. But I'm still going to have a secondary plan. I'm going to have a third plan. I'm going to have a fourth plan. Because if that plan doesn't work, I need to be able to quickly, based on what we did today, Go to another spot so i'm going to start at number one i go to two number three number four all the way down to ten that pretty much ensures unless the bite is totally garbage that we're going to have a good day we're going to we're going to put some 30s in the in the in the boat we're going to put some 40s maybe maybe we get lucky and get a 70 or 80. but that's all be, I'm, we're just not out there just fishing we've got that plan now i'm going to go back to when we were in the truck so I start talking to Sean. I'm like, okay, this is what we need to do. And this is what we need to do. And this is what we need to do. And sometimes I'm right. But sometimes I get on the water and I start listening to the fish. And I was completely wrong. Even though I've been doing this for 30 years. You say, oh, we should have had fish in 40 foot of water right off of this current break. Right. And slinging right around. And they should have been funneled down deeper right behind wing dike number one or number 12 or number 14. And they're not there. So I've got to reorganize what I've got to do. So I kind of start from scratch. So then I start moving down the most likely to the least likely. And sometimes you get halfway in between before you can 
get on fish that are acceptable of pulling our rods down. And, and I mean, that's the case. Because usually we will spend four or five anchors during the day in the month of August. Pretty much everybody knows daytime bite is pretty terrible in August. But on that one day a month, it's not. Or two days in August, it's not. I've had plenty of days where it's great guns during the day and horrible at night. But then three days later, there's no day bite at all and they're, they're biting all at night. And that, that's, that's the usual. So I, I really don't like setting up or landing on the water right before dark. I like to get three, four hours. I like to test some stuff. I like to see if there's a day bite because that's what I could be missing. So, kind of like Ted said, you can't go with preconceived notions. Even though I'm a human, I want, I want the fish to act like I want. I want, I want, I want I was like, okay, I want to go to this, this little curb ring, 30, 40 foot of water, I want to put stuff down and have them slam the rods down. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I'm just not close enough because it, it's a difficult thing, especially when you're anchor fishing and you marked fish back there and it, it, the water is deep and super swift and you have to anchor the boat with the anchor clear up there, let the anchor rope out and actually be able to remember exactly where you need to place your bait. I know it when I'm on it, I know it when I'm not on it. So sometimes I've kind of made a mistake of where I put the anchor, I'm like, Sean, it's time to get the anchor up again. We got to re-anchor. And usually it pays off because sometimes I'm like, yeah, it's good enough. And it's not. It almost never is. Almost never is. Unless fish are actively moving, searching around. And most of the time, believe it or not, they're not. Because in the Mississippi, where I fish, they don't really have to go to fish usually. They don't have to go to bait fish. A lot of times bait fish will come to them because they're in prime location. So I have to... I have to be a mental psychic. I have to be really, really particular sometimes. And I know it probably drives Sean nuts sometimes. I'm like, oh no, we gotta, we gotta be, we gotta be right here. You know? And, and, and if, if I sit more than 20 minutes and we're not getting any feedback on, on the rods, I start going, oh boy, uh, we're gonna have to do something different. And then I start moving stuff around. That's, that's another thing I want to talk about. So if anybody watches our live shows, or YouTube, it probably didn't show up on the YouTube as much as our live show. So I'll, we'll, we'll have rods out. And if they sit for 15 or 20 minutes, you see me go up and I'll crank them. I'll leave them right in rod holes. I'll crank them six times. I'll get that bait moving because 20 minutes of it sitting there, you got that heavy current going. They don't really have that much scent anymore. They're probably gonna have to just kind of bumble onto it. But if I can get that bait moving, cause a little flash, cause a little vibration, and get some scent going in again, sometimes it'll activate it. And the only way to, to know that in your mind is when you do it and it pays off in just a few minutes. With flatheads, sometimes you can do it. Sometimes it doesn't help, but if you're, if, if you're around, just say a basin hole, and you've got a few flatheads sprinkled around, and you, you've thrown your live baits, you've thrown your cut baits, and you're not getting feedback in the form of bites in 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes it helps to reel that just a little bit. Because then the bite's almost like that. I mean, many, many, many times, especially throwing out to the side. I do a lot of throwing out to the side, believe it or not. So I'll take a bait, so the current's this way. I'll cast it out, especially towards the main channel, let it bump let out a bunch of slack so maybe my baits up here slacked around so the current just doesn't whip it behind the boat so that it stays out there and it's possible that it gets caught on a trench that's running long ways that's a very difficult thing to, to target but i've caught a lot of big fish that way so let's just say we even got a little drop like this it's very difficult to target that drop appropriately if you're up above it but if you're to the side of it and you can throw on the outside of it and have it peg right to that. A lot of times, big blues will run those with their one whisker like this. And they'll run back and forth, or they'll just be sitting in that little depression. And now I've got that scent 
going right to them. And it was, it, it was the contour of the river and the current that actually let me be that precise. There's a lot of things, and I'm sure if you talk to Ted about this, a lot of things in smallmouth and all kinds of fish, those little things where you maybe throw an upstream, because sometimes, you know, like throw a crankbait downstream and up, sometimes that works. But sometimes it doesn't work very good. It's almost like you got to throw a crankbait upstream, and then all of a sudden it starts paying off. So it's almost the same thing in catfish. So sometimes the obvious thing, well, and sometimes that rod is the one that catches more and bigger fish on every anchor we do. So I might be sitting behind a wing dike that's underwater. Might cast out to the right and it dribbles down. It's, I cast it up shallow, dribbles down like this. And there's been many times I've caught seven or eight flatheads in a row on one rod. And nothing else is getting hit. So that tells me they're not moving. They're not searching around. They're positioned over there. And I'm getting it just right. So you go, okay, it's settled just right. Bang, there it is. We sat in Dead Man's Hole one time. And I'll try to describe it, but I'll draw it real quick. If I can remember what pocket it's in. Here it is. So you've got a wall, you've got the main river, it's falling 40 feet down. There's a hydro plant that spits water out like this, and it's all shallow here, four to six feet. And there's a giant eddy right here that is about 40 foot of water. And it goes straight off the wall at 40 foot. And Right here, it bumps up to about 12 foot of limestone. This is such a sheer drop. You can't really anchor up here because the, the current's so crazy, it just whips your boat this way and that way you can't actually. So what I do is I'll tie up to this wall, beat the boat up a little bit. But several times you can put, since the current's going this way, you can actually fish this way and you get almost nothing here until you throw out here and it bumps along and gets caught on this front where the upswing is let me uh let me show you what that's doing so your current flow over here is actually going this way this current's going this way so when you've thrown it and you throw it towards this it catches the line and bumps it along the bottom here until it gets caught on that upswing. And that upswing is nearly impossible to target except for sideways. So usually what I do is I'll take a long rod like this, and I will just, I mean, super cast it. And as it's going down, you feel it clunk, plinking off the Asian carp, plink, 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 and it hits the bottom. And then it starts its move. And then the rod bows over and you're like, it's in the sweet spot. And uh, there's been many times we caught 30 fish in a row on that rod while everything else set dead. And you mark fish everywhere, but these are the active fish right here. So that, that don't discount a sideways rod. And, you know, when I was younger, I would have looked at somebody and said, what are you doing? Trying to get a snag? I'd be like, uh, now I'm like, yeah, it's either a snag or a fish. You know, it's... Hero or zero right now, let's, let's go. And so, you know, that, that, uh, that, that's one of the things that has helped me. Um, out of the 10 uh, 100-pound fish, I've probably caught three of them that way, throwing out the side. Uh, Sean had a fish that was obviously somewhere in the territory of five foot long. Uh, it ended up breaking the line on the, uh, the, the anchor rope, but that was, uh, that was definitely a big fish. And I should remind people, Unless it's in a situation like this where there's a lot of pressure on the line, it'll look, if there is a lot of pressure on the line, it'll look like a real bite. It'll bow down. But if it's just caught out there on, say, a little clay ledge, you get that bite, the thump like this, and then all that rod does on the tip is go, ding, 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 ding. And when, when, when Sean was first uh, doing it, I'd be like, Sean, get that. It's a big fish. He's like, what? Where? <laughs> it's like, I don't see anything, but you know, just, just that. Nope, pick it up because that fish, 
It's out to the side. It's picked up, and all you're seeing is that sinker go along the bottom because there's so much slack in it. Reel it up, set the hook, and big, big, big fish. Any questions on what I've said so far? All right. So, I suppose you guys noticed this thing. Does everybody have one of these? Back in the day when we couldn't buy these, it was a complete pain in the butt to go try to catch bait. Sometimes we'd have to walk creeks and sometimes you have to what and you're too far from your bait tank to be able to bring it home and all that stuff. When I got this, I was like, that is awesome. So it made it really efficient because you know I can be 20 minutes from the truck, put all my bait fish in here, and if they start running out of oxygen, just refill it. It's one of the things that's really helped us be efficient with our time. And that's one thing. I, I don't think there's too many people that have a whole bunch of time these days. I don't. I wish I did. Again, that'd be awesome. But uh, no, but uh, uh, circle hooks, I'm sure everybody's used to circle hooks these days. Wide gaps. I like them big, giant circle hooks. I like the, the big baits. And, they, and they really, and there's a lot of people that ask me, how big of a bait do you use? Because you can catch big fish on small bait, no doubt. But if you're in an area like the gentleman over there was talking about earlier, he said, how many times do you catch small fish with your big fish? And I just sort of started to move to bigger hooks, bigger weights, bigger baits, because sometimes I felt like if I spent less time on 10 pound fish or 20 pound fish or 40 pound fish, I probably up my uh, success rates with really big fish. And that's exactly what happened out of, it. you know, because I'd move into an area and we'd catch a lot of fish, maybe 12 or 13 or 14 fish on one anchor. But it would be more rare back in the days when I used small baits to catch a really big one. Because I, I believe I missed big ones by just messing around and spending all my time just simply catching fish. Now, at one time, I was happy with that. I really was happy to catch 12 fish on an anchor. That was awesome. But now I'm real ate up with, you know, catching those big fish and I'm like kind of driven about it. And so I'm kind of being successfully oriented and, and, and you know, I'm constantly turning the Rubik's cube of thinking I got to stay in the big fish habitat. I got to keep my mind open. I got to listen to the fish. I got to use it. And I got to range out. That's the other thing too. A long anchor rope has helped me huge. I used to run maybe a hundred feet. Now I run 200 feet because I can, start i can i can move to the head let's just say it's a wider swath of basically nondescript water and i can find where the current kind of compresses and maybe that it comes up here and i'm going to set up here well i can set up short and i can ply my baits around and then if that doesn't work i can move down into it and say shawl 40 feet how many times have you heard that and then then you know we weren't on fishing then bam here it goes 250s or a 60 or a 70 or whatever like that and with 200 feet i can do it 50 feet at a time and i can just basically leapfrog so i'm looking at a whole zone like this throwing one anchor not really having to move again i can fish it from here to shinola i mean clear down there and i can use longer rods i can hook baits out left i can hook them out right and i can try to pinpoint with my back rods i try to pinpoint where i've marked fish where i remember them at I'm constantly triangulating. Okay, so that that's where the fish is. That you know, according to this name, we all do it. But how many times? Raise your hand. You mark fish. You go up. You put your anchor down, and it settles in. You're nowhere near where you're supposed to be. I've done it a thousand times. And you go, oh man, that that wasn't it. So Sean, grab the anchor again. See, I don't even have to pull the anchor up. So I can do it as many times as I want. But uh, no, I mean it, it, it's been a, it's. I've always liked catfishing, and it's something that always drives me. And uh, I actually end up getting angry as a person if I don't go. <laughs> I mean, like the longer I don't go after monsters, I get angrier and angrier. And my wife's like, "Man, you gotta go fishing." I'm like, you're right, I do. You're right. I got this problem. So, um, how about big flatheads? We talked about blues. I talked about blues a lot today. 
Big planets are a whole different creature. So blues, they tend to stick in faster current, a little deeper water. But flatheads are another, you can find them in deep water, especially if you watch any of the guys on the, uh, the Tennessee River. I'm always amazed to hear that they're catching giant flatheads in 40, 50, 60 foot of water. I'm like, what are they doing down there? But on the Mississippi, at least where I fish from, say, St. Louis all the way up to Minnesota, it seems that the proper water depths that I've found truly giant flatheads is usually no deeper than about 20, 25 foot. I usually have to focus on some sort of cover. I've found them in basin holes, but that's usually early in the year or late in the year where they're just happy-go-lucky and they're kind of hanging around and maybe you got 30 fish in, in, in a size of this. It doesn't really happen in the summer. They start fighting with each other. They start separating and all that stuff. But traditionally, I'd like to find some sort of decent, nicely sweeping current that comes into maybe a whole tree or maybe a succession of trees. Uh, I like them. I like to find them on wing dikes, especially when they're behind wing dikes, because I don't have to deal with snags and wood. Throw out, it's pretty awesome. The one thing about flatheads is, is that uh, they don't always take the rods down like you want them to. They do a lot of this. Tap, and then they start to bow the rod down, hesitate, and sometimes they'll just drop it. Sometimes you'll never even see the bite, but you reel your bait in, and it's not a crush mark from a channel cap. It's scaled on one side. You can tell. They're like, yep, that one got bit. Now, if, it, if it's very curved, you can tell it's a small fish. But if it's flat and wide, it's usually a big fish. And so, yeah, you can kick yourself for not, you know, but on Tuesday, they're doing that. Maybe on Wednesday, they're doing better, especially if you're fishing for them on the cover during the day. Now, if you're fishing for them at night, they tend to pull the rods down a little bit better. But it's not necessarily that they're going to feed at night better than the day. And that, that kind of goes against normal thinking. And it's not that they're not feeding more at night than they are during the day, but I can pin, I can tell you pretty much where they're at during the day. Really difficult to tell you exactly where they're at at night because they could have moved up to the flat, they could have went to, they could have went, you know, up, they could have went out, they could have went down. So maybe I'm fishing an area like this, it's got a single tree with a beautiful root ball and it's, it's awesome, it's been there for 20 years. Usually if the bank side is next to the root ball, I can pretty much guarantee if I can lay it against the trunk somewhere, in between, I can't, I can't, I can catch small flatheads if it's up shallow near the bank. But if I've got seven to 15 foot of water in that range is where I'm going to catch my fish. Most of the big fish, small fish up shallow towards the, towards the shore. And as the current sweeps around, I'll catch smaller fish out there. It's usually that, that nice current. And you, if the current's too strong out at the tip, not much going on out there. You might catch a five pounder and it's kind of running around, but on that inside, you can almost always pick out where the big fish are once you start doing it. So anybody use that very technique? Raise your hand. Only two of us? All right, well, that's something to try because you can pinpoint those fish based on that, that current. Here's the other thing too. If you're gonna cast, I always, thumb my spool as soon as it hits the water like normal, but I also feel the tension as it goes down. Because sometimes there's areas that look too fast. I'm thumbing the spool down and all of a sudden, two, three, four foot off the bottom, it nicely lets off and I'm like, I turn to Sean, I go, that's the flathead current we're looking for. And once we find that regular flathead current based on the cover situation, we're usually on good fish. Now it's not always 60s or 50s or whatever. But a good flathead between 20 and 40 pounds, I'll take that any day. So I've done a lot of talking about catfish today, but we're gonna keep doing it. So I would say one of the biggest constants in catfishing would have to be 
the difference between rivers, lakes, and streams. So if, if you're going to fish a small river, it's basically like Ken Fishman said years ago, riffle hole run, riffle hole run. So you got the shallow, hard bottom that empties into the softer bottom that creates a hole, and then you've got a run. Now a run is described by a fisherman as a long, slow pool, almost like a canal. So I kind of tend to look at big rivers like that too. Even though runs, which would be just kind of the same depth and it goes for maybe a mile or two, it, they hold fish. They're transition areas for fish. Fish will station there. But I'm not looking to ply my time in slow water, try to pinpoint fish that can go any direction. I want to directionalize fish. So that's how I'm thinking to be able to contact big fish, that big flatheads or big blues or big channel cats, really. I want that current to direct them towards me. I want to confine them a little bit. That's why when, 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 when the water goes down, it's a little bit more difficult to target fish besides the fact that they might just not bite. I love underwater structures such as, I mean, Sunken barges, sunken ships, boats, bridge abutments. I don't care if it's a Volkswagen Beetle down there. There's going to be a flathead next to it if it's got the right current. It's going to be next to it or in it. That's kind of a cool thing about flatheads, really. Uh, blues, not so much. They don't. Uh, I mean, I've caught blues on cover like that. I went to the James River one time. We had a triple on 50-pound fish right next to a Spanish galleon that had been sunk there since the Revolutionary War. It was awesome. And you can still do it on the James because some of those sunken ships are in such deep water. It's a pretty awesome thing. Now, most of the ships on the Mississippi are not in deep water. They're in flathead style water. They're not really in blue cat depth. So, um, but that, that is one of the most interesting things. And change the current and you change the location of the fish. That's why I put current number one in my mind as being able to target big fish and numbers of big fish. And how we know that is, well, one of the ways we know it is the James is a tidal river. So you're positioned on the upstream part, and there's a, say, a 50-foot old wooden Civil War era barge stuck on a ledge in 50 foot of water. And you're marking them on the front side, because that's the active side. Or if the water is up recently they may be on the back side because you know they're going to want to maintain kind of the right current but as soon as that tide switches the location of the fish switch, and you can watch it it's kind of cool so like uh, uh in my early years i had, had a big round tank and i put obstructions in the tank and i had a a, a large uh, uh filter basically a pool filter and I, I could i could change the direction of the current i could put obstructions in it and all i had to do was move the current just a little bit and it would move the location of the fish every single time. And they, they, would just, they would just go to their preferred speed of current. There wasn't any depth change in there, so I, I know that current's first. Now, deep matters, especially when the water starts dropping. Like, I, I was, I've been talking to a couple of people that right now the Missouri's really low, the Mississippi's really low, a lot of places are low. So in their fight or flight mechanism, they don't want to get trapped if you're up shallow. So as soon as that water starts coming down, they start filtering into deep waters. And if, if you look at any of the, I mean, all of us probably started catching other things besides catfish. If, if we were fishing, uh, there we go. That's a little better. Um, if, 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 if we were fishing smaller streams that were kind of dirty or cloudy, you could find catfish or smallmouth or anywhere, almost anywhere, up in the shallows, up in the whatever. But as soon as it gets low and clear, right down to the deep holes. And you can see it. I mean, I, I live right next to one. They're all the way up by my house. You can catch them all over until water gets low and clear, and all of a sudden I got to go a mile down because it's the first deep water. It's the same thing, only on a bigger scale. Now, if the one thing about, like, say, the Potomac, where Stan fishes, not the Potomac, sorry, the James, is that since it, sorry, I got the Potomac on the brain. I've been talking to a lot of guys from Potomac today. Uh, so on the James or the Potomac, since it's a tidal river, it's constantly doing this kind of movement. It's almost like the slowest wave that you ever wanted to see. So it's one way and then it's the other way, about what, every 12 hours, is that right? Every six hours, that's right. The majors on the 12. So 
that's that's a little bit more of a difficult situation. But the Mississippi always flowing out, the Missouri always flowing out. We've got basically up or we got down. We don't have back and forth as far as this or that. So there, there's usually going to be a general trend. So filtering down into deep water, a lot of people are like, hey, I'm, I'm having trouble right now locating fish on the, in the, on the Missouri because it's so low. You know, things that we've done all the time, we find fish here and we're not finding them. I said, well, the only thing I can tell you without actually being on the water is go deep. Just go deep. Water's down, go deep. Then start listening to the fish from there. Because it's not always that they're down in the deep water. Let me tell you a story about that dead man's hole again. <laughs> Sean and I got unlucky enough that they dropped the water at this dead man's hole. And all this shallow water holds multitudes of channel cats. And I mean, these things are raggedy. By the time August comes, or you know, they're this long, they should be weighing 10, 12 pounds. They weigh six. They're all skinny, big headed, and they're nibblers. They're, but they drop this water a little bit, maybe a foot, right before we got, I think every channel cat emptied into dead man's hole. And it was the, just constant, one, two, three. I, we caught more than 100 channel cats in like six hours. We caught two blue cats. We didn't go there for channel cats. We can catch all them at home an hour away. We didn't drive three hours to go get marauded, just destroyed by channel cats. But, that, but that's the power of that. That's Because that's, channel cats don't mind shallow water. But when it starts to drop and drop fast, pew, they'll filter down into deep water too. Because even though you will once in a while catch them in this 40 foot. That's once in a while. Drop that water and they all spill up, spill down in there. And now, and, and so that's the proof. Besides the fact that there's not two, I mean, flatheads will actually get stuck in shallower water or say water that's sectioned off once the river goes down more than channel cats or blues. Because flatheads, what do they do? They love to maintain their real estate. They love to, they love to, they like something, they get in it and they defend it. And you know, they, they got their root ball and they got their little current, and they got their little kingdom. They want to defend it. They want to hold on to it, which, which actually traps them quite a bit. Like uh, uh, in the spring on the Mississippi, any of those major tributaries, the Rock, the Wapsi, the Skunk, anything like that, they're decent sized rivers. Well, in May, they'll start going up these rivers. Well, if that water drops drastically, they still have their job to do. They're still going to do their spawning. So they're reluctant to come back out. And some of them get stuck in those tributaries all year long. There's not enough flow. Most of the time on a normal year when the water levels don't drop real drastically, they'll go up as much as 100 miles, 50 miles, whatever. But as soon as that water starts to stabilize and maybe drift down a little bit, they'll start filtering back out, especially in the fall, because they like to overwinter in the big river. Well, some years they don't make it that far. So that, that, that's an interesting thing. So when you see people catching 50 pound flatheads on a little creek, you know what's happened, because that's not their normal habitat. It was higher, they came up there to do their spawn thing, the pre-spawn, and then they pretty much get trapped. So the, the fight or flight mechanism is the, probably the most powerful instinct that they have. Time to stay alive. That's why they winter in deep water. And I talked to a biologist one time that told me, because we were talking about this, I said, why would they not necessarily, why, why would they travel that far to go to water that's over 20 foot deep to winter? We know, we know there's populations of fish that winter in, in shallower water than that, but by average, it's usually 20 or more foot. And he said, you know, Tim, he says, the, the only thing I can think of is when, when the ice is coming out on a mid-sized river and it goes through that ripple hole run thing, you will have ice jams. And all of a sudden you'll have the water picking up gigantic sheets of ice and it will crush down into the water and basically smash these fish. And so over the eons, they have had to kind of evolve to where they're going to stay in deeper water or get crushed by the ice. You know, the big ice sheets come in, all that stuff. So I thought that was pretty interesting, although we can't, I wish I could talk to a catfish for like 20 minutes. I'd ask him a lot of questions, but I can't. Uh, so the fight or flight is the most important. Then I would say I would have to say, as far as catfish behavior goes, I would say the urge to spawn is 
probably overrides that in the month that they spawn. <laughs> because that urge is so powerful, they, like I said, they'll get trapped. They will do things that they don't normally do. So that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and then after that, so they want to stay alive. They want to make little babies. And then they got to eat. That's pretty much all they do. And so we take advantage of that and we can sort of kind of predict where they're going to be. And the longer you do it, the more uh, experience you have on your water, you're going to be able to pick the times and whatever, you know, if, if, if Sean were to call me uh, and say, Hey, uh, where do you think we ought to fish in uh, May? I already know. I know what pool I want to fish. I know what species I want to target. I know what baits we're going to use. I want to go, okay. So then what about August? Yep. I already know. How about July? Nope, I'm not even going because they're mostly on the spawn. We're going to target something else. We're going to go whatever. So, uh, you know, and the, the catfish calendar is pretty much set in stone. It, it'll fluctuate a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, you know. Maybe the spawn's a little bit early. Maybe it'll last a little bit longer. Maybe we won't have enough high water to get them in tributaries and they'll have to stick to the main channel. Uh, sometimes we have too much water early in May and a lot of the flatheads go off of the main channel and they, they spread out. And that actually happened to us uh, two years ago. I was going to my big fish spots, and man, I couldn't scare up a big fish to save my life. And, you know, I even looked at it. So we're kind of cruising past some secondary channels that normally only hold small fish. Small fish, I mean 30 pounds and under on platter. And it's eating at me all day as I keep fishing my same main river type habitat. I'm still in that 15, 20, 25 foot of water. I'm still targeting stuff as close to the main channel as I can because of my past experience for the last 30 years. Most of my big fish come from that, that, that area in the main channel. But it was bugging me, bugging me, bugging me, bugging me. I'm like, why are we not catching fish here? Why, are we, why didn't I pull up onto this barge in 15, 20 foot of water and at least get a bite? And I kept remembering that root ball in four foot of water that was off of the channel. And I thought, man, is this like it was in like 2016 where you pull up to that stupid stuff and there's three flatheads, 30, 40, and 50 pounds sitting on that near Flathead Island? And it probably was, but I was too stubborn. I'm, I, I'm getting kind of old and I'm thinking I know everything and I'm, I'm just gritting it and just sticking with my thing so after that i said sean i'm not going to do that anymore we're going to we're going to we're going to keep our mind open and not just keep doing that same thing but what i didn't remember because i wasn't on the water it was high water and it's high water for a long time april may beginning of june it finally started to come back down and we just weren't doing good now if it would have stayed up just say it was august and it would have stayed up we still wouldn't have had to go into secondary and tertiary channels they still would have been next to the main river because why? They don't have the urge to spawn in August. I didn't take that in account. I didn't take into account that that's the most important thing that they do. They stay alive, they make babies, and then they eat or not eat. And that, you know, that's what keeps us coming back, really. If it was easy, if every time you went out, you said, yeah, we caught giant fish every time, you'd be like, no. But I stay awake at night sometimes. I'm like, oh, man, why, why didn't this work? Why didn't this work? What did I miss? That Rubik's Cube, I didn't turn it the right way. I didn't think about this. I didn't listen to the fish. I was too prideful sometimes. Sometimes I'm thinking I'm master of everything. I got the whole epic catfish boat. I got a YouTube channel. I got, man, I'm going to go and we're going to whip up on the fish and it doesn't happen. And then I, I'm like, man, must have been the fish. That just makes me feel better. I know it's me somewhere. I didn't, I zigged when I should have zagged. I didn't get to, pa I went pattern A, B, C, and I didn't understand I needed to go all the way to pattern H, like I would have done when I was 30. When I was 30, I was a rod slinging, bait slinging mess. I was anchoring 50 times a day and trying to figure out everything, running up onto the front of my boat. I used to have the, they built rod compartments, and when I guided, that's one of the most things I'd always hear like you ran around that boat like nobody I mean I would too I'd run from one side to the other grab rods and throw he knows he, he was with me and uh so but but now I'm old and slow a little bit and now I think I know everything and sometimes it bites me right on the butt it does sometimes it pays 
But I will say, as far as big fish, I've caught more big fish in the last 10 years than I did in the first 20. Because I, I, I keep to my big fish plan more than running a muck and slinging baits and throwing this and going into water too shallow and, uh, you know, not listening to the fish. I still listen to the fish. But that's one of the things that keeps me coming back because I, I can learn more things. I mean, shoot, I'd fished that pool for almost 25 years. And, and uh, Sean and I moved into an area that I hadn't looked at for 20 years because it's normally not any good. I marked barrels of what I thought was barrels on the bottom. They were just blips on my soda like this. And I knew they weren't there when I looked at it before. I looked on the shore and I saw like concrete culverts about the same size as I was marking. I thought, man, did we have a flood and they washed those things in there and whatever. And I didn't see any, I didn't see any of those marks up off the bottom at all. They were all belly to the bottom. And I looked and there was like 25 of them. I go, those can't be barrels, can they? Yeah, they can be barrels. So it was still during the day in our, our normal procession of where we're going to check things out, whatever. So we went up to Missouri. We did this and we slung some baits and we finally came back to it. And 25 of those barrels was now four. They were fish. And so as I'm beating myself up mentally, we anchor the boat and we throw out big giant pieces of carp and sucker and everything else. And I'm trying to get the live feed going and Sean's rod goes down and it's a giant. Exactly what I was marking, except for now 20 of them are gone and I should have fished them exactly. You know, and that's what everybody says. You should fish them when you see them. But one thing I've learned is there's neutral position there's negative position, and then there's active position. And active to me is just a little bit above bottom, not way up. If they're way up, they're just kind of hanging out like they do in Bass Pro Shop tank, like this. They don't care about anything. They're just kind of cruising around. Or maybe they're just in place, like this. But if I can mark them with their heads down, I get excited. So if I would have went in there and those 25 culvert barrel looking things would all been like this, or, you know, kind of up, I've been like, get, get ready, Sean, because we're on. And I have not marked 25 giants like that in a spot so small, probably only from that trailer to that trailer from here to the curtain. They were all laying in there, but they were gone. And next time we went, we didn't mark a single fish in there. It was only 25 foot deep. The current wasn't, it was better. Next, next time we went, we checked it. It was a little less current. There was no fish in there. And that's one thing about blues. They're highly mobile. So if you find them in 20 foot of water one day and, you know, you best try to look for a similar situation going on wherever you go until you find another situation. <laughs> like, oh, boy, what, what, you know, they're on the wood, they're on the rock, they're in deep, they're in shallow, they're whatever. And then you just got to fish. And you're like, you know, that's when that's. That's when I should get the dragon baits out because every once in a while I'll get in that situation, even though my area confines fish, it promotes anchors with really good numbers and big fish, but sometimes they're spread out. I mean, shoot, we went three weeks later and we marked big fish occasionally here. None of them, none of them grouped, just one here, one there. And it's hard for me to anchor up on one big fish, it really is. If I'm only seeing one big fish, I know that I've got maybe a 30% chance of actually contacting that fish because who says it's gonna come upstream to me? Who says I'm gonna get exactly in his face? Who says he doesn't go out in the main channel or down? So I, I don't like those odds, but if I see three, four big fish that I'm interested in, yeah, I'll, I'll put the I'll put the effort into anchoring. And if I see twenty, I'm really excited. Uh, so the Missouri River, I have fished it, but not religiously, because I have the choice where I fish. I can either go into the Missouri, which is not all that fantastic looking, from the confluence right at Alton. The Alton Mississippi River stretch holds more and bigger fish with a consistency 
than that mouth where it gets all shallow and all the sand's coming down. And you got those long wing dikes, all that stuff, and you can only find 12 to 15 foot of water. Now, I've heard that the farther up you go, it actually gets better because the sand infiltrates, you know, and all that stuff's not very good. Uh, I know several guys that do, and pretty much it's riprap and wing dikes. Is there anything I'm missing? So, I mean, Missouri's got, what, three types of wing dikes? They've got the finger style, they got the box style, and then they got something else somebody was telling me about. But it's different. The one thing Missouri does have, which is pretty awesome, is big moon eye. Big moon eye and big gold eye. They've got them in St. Louis, too, but I was just describing the situation to where. And that is one of my favorite baits. If I can get a moon eye, if I can get a gold eye, I prefer that over even the big uh, suckers and carp. Uh, for one, I can catch a lot more flatheads on cut bait moon eye than I can cut sucker. Why? We don't know. But when I'm slinging moon eye, we'll catch a lot of flatheads usually. You know, especially the ones that are like in the transition where it's blue cat, the habitat mostly, but you know, maybe flatheads are on the fringe. Like maybe you're throwing in the main current here and you throw kind of behind a wing dike over there and it slides into a spot and you get a, a flathead. And every once in a while, you, and, and I call it a luck flathead, every once in a while you catch freaking 40. I, we caught seven flatheads in a row on tiny shad once like this. And I said, what is going on here? I mean, tiny, like little butter bean shad. But it, it was just an extra rod that I was throwing out to the side. And you say, what went on there? And then you try to reproduce and it doesn't happen. So those are the things that keep us coming back. Um, So, Got a my idea of the Missouri is that, of course, wing dikes are obstructions. You've got a lot of current, hey, Tim, and it's going to create holes. You yeah. had a question in the audience right here. From Tim to Tim. A little bit. All right, we'll get to that one. That's good, because I was kind of trying to figure out what I want to talk about. But let me finish my thought on the uh, Missouri River first. So you basically got obstructions in the form of wing dikes, man-made wing dikes, sticks, rocks, stuff like that. And so that current, when it's up, especially scours out behind them and sometimes the front. One of the best successes that I've had with the limited exposure I've had to the Missouri River wing dikes is basically perching my boat which is rough on my i mean if you have a really nice boat you're probably not going to want to do it but i don't care about my boat it's a battleship it's old and i beat it to death and it's still ticking so anyway i'll put it right on the rocks throw the anchor up on the rocks and then use that where you've got a long box dike that's going with the current i usually contact most of my fish not more than probably five feet out from it is, 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 is that one of the things that you guys do on the Missouri, raise your hand. Okay, so wing dikes are not all created equal. That's one thing. We all know that. How do you tell the difference between a good wing dike? Uh, that's, a, that's a very common question I get. How do you pick the right wing dike? Because, you know, in, in a pool, like I was explaining earlier, there might be 100 wing dikes on it. And it's going to take a long time to try to fish a hundred wing dikes. So I use kind of a criteria list to pick that out. Just say I'm on a new stretch and I'm trying to figure out what the best wing dike is. I'm a big fan of wing dikes that are under the water instead of the ones that are above water. That's the first thing. Because even in a low water situation, you'll still have some dikes that are underwater all the time. Those are the ones I prefer. That, that's, that's number one. Number two is deep water off the tip and in the hole behind it. So I don't want, I, so if I move up onto a dike and Sean says, what do you think? I go, that looks like drum water to me because it's only 19 feet, 20 feet. Not really anything all that special. It's kind of, you know, whatever. But, it, but if, if we go behind, you know, if it's 14 foot or 12 foot or six foot, and I go off of that and it shotgun straight down into 25 or 30 at a pretty good steep angle. And it's got maybe a ledge over here. It might have a rock, might have some piece of wood in here. And then 
25, 30, 35, 40 foot of water, it just, it rose. It, it, it kind of went up from pretty decent to really good. And then I do not prefer wing dikes that have a whole bunch of sand built up on the front side because that tells me that the, the current is slow enough that it just does it just didn't cut it. For some reason, I just don't have that much success. But the sand's built up on the front side, and you've got basically sweeping out. The, the only thing I like about that is the tip, of the current break, the current seam. So, so that's one thing. Now, if I can find a wing dike that is in proximity, well, let's, let, me, let me not jump that far ahead. I like wing dikes with a lot of space between them. A lot of space. The more the space, the better. Because if you got wing dike and wing dike, wing dike, wing dike, wing dike, wing dike, it's going to split the fish up. Because when fish travel up, you're hugging the, you know, the contour of the river. They're going to get held up by pretty much the first wing dike they come to. Yeah, sometimes they'll go over one, sometimes they'll go around one. But the best wing dikes that I've found on anywhere I've ever fished wing dikes usually has at least a quarter mile or more of no dikes behind it. I love that that way, oh, and, and even natural wing dikes, that, another spot where it's just basically a clay ledge that comes out and it drops straight off. If I've got a free range for, I don't care if it's even five miles, it's even better. But the number one factor for me, so I'll fish wing dikes that are like that. The number one factor for me, is if I got a tributary river coming in above that dike somewhere, so that doubles my current. That doesn't double, but you know, if it's a decent sized tributary, the Des Moines, the skunk, the Wapsi, the raccoon, whatever you'd want to call it. But as I'm going, All right. There might be three wing dikes between this tributary coming into the main river. But this one is going to catch a bunch of sediment. All right. This one's not usually any good. Everywhere I've ever fished wing dikes with tributaries above them. Almost no good. By the time you get to one of these, especially the ones that don't have that means that fish can come up this bank and sort of hang out here, which is pretty interesting. Now, if it so happens that this one's the best one with the deeper water out of the three, I'll still fish it, but it's usually not as good. Better yet is if this one wasn't here, this one wasn't here, and I got a quarter mile or more, and I got a single wing dike on the same side as the river is pumping water into this. <laughs> Sean and I pulled down to the river on this very situation a couple of years ago. And the tributary river had received a bunch of rain and the Mississippi was still low and clear. And I was thinking, man, and it looked like coffee spilling into an aquarium. Uh, it looked bad. You could see it because it's kind of high perched where the boat ramp is and you could see across to it. And I'm like, man, I'm kind of worried about that. I don't know, because we, we, we kind of went that whole way just to fish that specific spot. And the milky color didn't matter. It didn't change the temperature. The temperature was basically the same. It didn't get cold. And man, we wore out the giant fish on that. Okay, Tim, remind me of your question again because I talked too long and I forgot. It. Very good. Nope, I don't, I do not drive my boat on. I have, but I don't love it. Um, I take in consideration that flatheads can be staged on log jams out ahead of them if they're active. As much as 10 feet. They live in it, but they can actually get up and just sit there and wait to ambush prey fish. So I make sure not to overthrow them first thing. I listen to the fish. If I fished five log jams ago and they're all in the log jam, there's none, I'll just skip right to it. But so I'll stay about probably from me to the gentleman in the green hat, probably 
50, 60, 70 feet. And I'll start plunking. Because I know there's nothing in between me and him, me and me and the log jam. I'll start, I'll start plunking. And sometimes it pays off. When, when they're active and out there, I mean, you might catch one like out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of nowhere. Their home is right there, but they're not in it. If I go directly to it, I've skipped over top of them and I've missed all those fish. Yes, yes, both. Sometimes I'll, I'll go a little bit more, to, you know, I'll have four to six rods out and I'll put some in shallower water because because remember, every anchor is a experiment. So if every anchor is an experiment, I'm trying to listen to the fish. If they're telling me they like that seven foot, that seven foot out 10 feet from it, that's more information I have for my next spot. So if I don't get anything, or maybe I, maybe I catch one fish, one five pound, that's not going to prove too much to me. So now I'm going to start, I'm going to go, Sean, 40 feet or 20 feet. He's going to go out and he's going to let out anchor rope until we're close enough to it. And sometimes you just can't get them to go and I go, Sean, we got to go in after them. And you know what that means? You're, you, I mean, you're going to, it's risky. Even if you do hook one, you may not get it, or you're just going to hang your stuff up, especially in the Mississippi where there's a lot of high wood. Because not every log jam lays down real nice. I mean, there's a few of them that lay real nice, but somewhere between us and them, <laughs> there's some sort of log sticking up or something going to happen. Now, the ones that are underwater, I do basically the same thing. I have to mark them. I have to go up above and I'll lay bait. I'll just, okay, I'll give my gifts to the, to the flatheads and hopefully they partake. But if they don't, then I have to go in after them. And you know, honestly, some, some log jams, depending on what your population is, won't hold a single flathead. But if the population is pretty decent, they haven't moved off the main channel, they're uh, generally kind of agreeable in a... Uh, uh, that's another thing we should talk about. The flathead population is bigger than what a person thinks. So they don't have to eat that much. They really don't. I could feed a flathead in a 70 degree tank and he may not decide to eat those two bait fish, even though he easily could for three days. He might eat them right away. He might just get all excited and eat them right away. He might wait two days, it might wait three days. I might have three flatheads in a tank and feed them 30 bait fish, and I still got 30 bait fish in there two to three days later. But once they turn active for some unknown reason, they destroy every bait in the tank. They're like, why? You would think somebody brought you some food, you're going to eat it, right? Not a flathead. No, no. Flatheads go, I've seen bait fish swim all over their lips like this, and they go back up from it, sit down. I'm like, really? And then I've seen them where they, you know, a day later, they get up and chase them all. Or you hear them that night splashing water out of your tank and all that stuff. You know, I used to keep some pretty big flatheads. You know, we'd have a 125 gallon tank. I Then I got a 150, then I got a 225, then I was keeping flatheads up to 20, 25 pounds. I kept a red tail and a flathead. That was some war right there, buddy. Flathead could dish out punishment and the red tail could take it. It was awesome because the red tails are all armored, but they're not near as tough as a flathead. I mean, they grab each other by the tail and slam each other on the bank. You hear rocks and gravel flying and water spilling out. My wife's like, oh, you got to do something about that. I said, here's some earplugs. Any questions? Okay. Yep. Deep water, especially this time of year. I'd look for, that's what I'd apply first. I wouldn't always necessarily be right, but if the water's three, three, four foot low, let's just say I was even on the bank. I still want to range out. I'd bring the longest rods I could get. I'd look at a map. I'd try to get to the deepest water closest to shore access I could find. That's what I would do in a preliminary. And this is, you know, me thinking as I'm driving to Oklahoma, that's my original plan. It may change when I get there. I might go, huh, they're not in deep water at all. They're in seven and eight foot of water and I got to drag or I got to do this. Maybe I was planning on anchoring. Maybe I was planning on, uh, you know, trying for flatheads. But when I get there, there's just not any flatted structure to focus on. You know, maybe I got to say, well, geez, I got to, I got, I went here for flatheads, but I'm going to fish 
fish for blues. And vice versa. Happens all the time, especially in new water. New water, you get this idea, man, you get all excited. Look at the map, and man, I'm looking at it, and I'm calling Sean, and I'm drawing pictures at the table and all this stuff. And you get there, and you're like, oh, this wasn't anything what I thought it was at all. But sometimes it's better. Sean and I drove over the Mississippi at Hannibal, and we look, we both look over to the right, and we're like, oh, look at the bridge and the current's coming through. Oh, geez, we're coming, we're coming to fish, you know, and we will. We will. Ha haven't even been on it, but it's, it's got a nice high bank. It's not all this low stuff. It looks like deep water. The current looks good. Flatheads look fantastic. But that doesn't mean that they are. The pool might be heavily commercial fished. It might be this. It might be. This. It might break wide open, you know, where I can't see it on the road. I haven't looked at it on the map yet. You know, it might be carp and gar water for as far as the eye can see. I mean, there's entire pools up by him that he'd be hard pressed. You'd be hard pressed to find much because it's basically just a giant one mile wide pool uh, and you got a narrow main channel and it's not very deep either. They're there, but that's where the bank pullers and the trot liners and the juggers do good. Not us rod and reel guys. We, we need them. We need it immediately. If I had a nickel for every time somebody called me and said, yep, somebody caught a 98 pound planet on a limb line just the other day. I'm like, yeah, because the limb line fished for four days and it never got tired and it never had to go to sleep and it never had to answer the phone. I said, that thing fished and he had 50 of them. So there's 50. So four days times 50, do all the math. It'd be like us throwing out six rods for like a week and a half. We could probably do pretty good in a week and a half of never sleeping, whatever. But the whole thing about catfishing is we is I have to look at it. If I'm going to give advice, it's it's it's, it's got to be based on rod and reel. It's got to be based on today. It's got to be based on now and, and what's possible. You know, I rarely talk about what somebody caught on a 250 hook trout line and all that stuff. So you know, as you're listening to these guys that are going to tell you. There's a doc hero everywhere we go. There's a guy telling us, man, you need to do, you need to, you need to fish at where they dump the grain into the water. Them catfish just sit there and open their mouths and they're 300 pounds. And they say it seriously, but their eyebrows always go up like this. You ought to go down there. It's the greatest thing you ever saw. I'm like, all right. Catfish blow dams as big as Volkswagens. Let me tell you, I've fished dams for a long time with big stuff. If there was catfish the size of Volkswagens, I would know. I believe probably maybe six foot. That's what I want to catch. I've caught the five footers. I want the six, 72 inches next. That's next. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Oh, man. Yes, sir. Um, 